I'm going to take a few minutes to visit with you about, I guess, my experiences and observations on how wheat responds to herbicides and some of my experiences in the last nearly 40 years of uh, working in wheat. And one of the very first projects I got involved with happened to be on the back of the station trying to kill wheat prior to planting uh, corn. And you know what? I thought, surely this is not a big deal. Why are we spending time doing it? And I can find out, you know what? Sometimes wheat can be fickled and it's not really easy to control. There are sometimes it can be a little bit of a challenge. Let me uh, go through some things that we did here at the wheat school. And by the way, if you didn't attend our wheat school, uh, this is you're going to get a shortened version of this right now. We had an opportunity to put on a training back early in the spring. Maybe we'll talk more about that if we have time. But uh, some of the things that we learned out of this, this uh, experience, and it was some very visual observations that we made. This is where we looked at glyphosate at one quart per acre. And back a few years ago, the standard rate of glyphosate, and this is a generic glyphosate, okay, was uh, a quart per acre. That was generally the, the, the standard rate. Or if you're using Roundup Power Max, that's equivalent to about 21 to 22 ounces would be the standard rate. Well, in more recent times with the herbicide resistant weeds, we're encouraging, you know, we want to make sure we kill all the weeds. So we bumped that rate up. It's more like a quart and a half would be what I'd say the today's standard rate. So, but at any rate, having said all this, let's go back. We use a quart rate in this case. We took these photos about uh, three weeks after we sprayed. And this is with Glystar Plus. Remember, that's a generic glyphosate, eight and a half pounds of ammonium sulfate. Okay, same mix over here, except we also add the pound and a half of atrazine. Can you tell a difference? Right? What happened? Wheat looks like it's starting to respond. It's starting to die back. See some necrosis, a lot of yellowing in there. It's turning yellow, but we don't see much in the way of necrosis here with the atrazine. What, what's, what's the deal? Atrazine and this is, is atrazine doing something here, you think? Antagonism, maybe? But you know what? We put ammonium sulfate. If we have that antagonism, sometimes that ammonium sulfate will out will help you overcome any antagonisms that you get with tank mix partners. It didn't help over here. Okay. What do you think? Well, maybe a little more to the story. The five previous nights prior to spraying these, this was these were sprayed in mid-March. So that early to mid-March, uh, we had nighttime temperatures of somewhere around 26 to nearly 30 degrees. The night that we sprayed the on the day that we sprayed these, it was like 20, 20 degrees Fahrenheit, and then uh, the next night was like 18 degrees Fahrenheit. So those temperatures were really cold. They put that wheat under stress. It just didn't have an opportunity to express that, get that maximum kick, if you will, at least at three weeks out after we sprayed. All right, we'll go another few weeks on out. And you know what? This stuff is it's getting closer to dying without the atrazine. We put the atrazine in there. Control is improved, but it's still nothing compared to where we didn't use atrazine. Okay. So it looks like that maybe those cold time temperatures did have an impact. Uh, oh, here, excuse me, Carl. We'll put it over there. Thank you, sir. Bump up the rate, and you know what? Uh, up to a quart and a half. This is 22 days, roughly three weeks out after spraying. Uh, a little more activity here than this one here. But the quart and a half, if we put that side by side with the, the, uh, the one quart per acre rate, we would probably see a little bit better control, okay, at that higher rate. Think it over. Thank you, sir. Now, that high rate, about five, five weeks out after application, no doubt this is on its way out. And that one there is, it's getting closer, but it's still not there. It took several weeks before this thing actually came to its maximum activity and it actually it killed it eventually. But it just, you know, you're thinking and sitting there and waiting and waiting. Is this ever going to happen? You know, you're thinking of alternative plans. Do I need to spray this thing again? Or, you know, you just got to give it time. You got to be patient. 
okay, when you find those kind of situations, okay? <clears throat> All right, we'll take another compound, put paraquat in the mix here, or not in the mix, but looking at paraquat as an option. This is paraquat without atrazine, this is with atrazine, two pint per acre rate. What do you think? Better control with atrazine? What's the difference? The atrazine hurts the glyphosate, but it's helping paraquat? Is that making sense? Sarah's, yeah, big time sense. Sure does. Yes, it does. This, uh, no doubt that, that adding atrazine is another photosynthetic inhibitor. A little bit different in terms of its mechanism and where it's attacking, but it's doing the, similar to what paraquat is. That together, I think, has really enhanced the control, but it did not do that with, with glyphosate. That was a two pint per acre rate of paraquat. We bumped that rate up to three pints. Now we're getting kind of expensive here compared to what we're using with glyphosate, but uh, no doubt we're much, we're closer to getting this thing killed here. This is, this is closing in on it, but it's not, it's not there by any stretch, okay? With the, uh, without atrazine. So, long story short here is it looks like with atrazine, mixing it with paraquat helps paraquat. Mixing it with the uh, with glyphosate may impact activity, especially if we got those cool temperatures. Any kind of a stress factor impacts that. Sharpen. I won't call it a real new chemistry, but it's it's relatively new compared to some of the other things that we've been using here. This is a, a picture where, you know, I've, we're trying to simulate a tank mix problem. You know, when you're in the early spring, it's not unusual where you, you're, you're spraying corn ground for burn down. And next thing you know, you're turning around and trying to get back in and, and, uh, and spray uh, your, your wheat with, for nitrogen or putting on Harmony Extra. You're going between those crops and you know, you, you think you re rinsed your sprayer out pretty good, but you come to find out maybe it wasn't quite as thorough as I thought it was. This is trying to simulate that, this type of thing. This is, if you'll see, the, the, they almost look like paraquat burning spots, if you will, okay? Real spotty looking appearance. That's uh, Sharpen. Sharpen is a PPO inhibitor, okay? A little different chemistry than we've ever used in, um, in wheat. Okay, that's sharpened. Valor can do the same type of thing. I don't have a good picture with Valor here, but Valor can do the same thing. Y'all familiar with Valor? And this is one of those, Valor is one of those products that if you don't pay attention to cleaning out your tank, you'll pay the price. You've got to be thorough. You know, at the end of the day, you stop your sprayer and you think, oh, uh, I've got a few more gallons to spray. I'll finish it off tomorrow. Now you might want to finish it now and get over with because if you leave it in that tank overnight, it's it's have to set up and be a harder to can, to clean that tank. So and there are some cleaners you can use, but they're pretty caustic. You know you don't want to have to use them if you don't have to. <clears throat> Make sure I get this right. Okay, I've you know if you've attended any field days and I talked about uh, Osprey, I, I've did a lot of work on this back when Osprey first came out. It's an ALS inhibitor, okay? Much like Harmony Extra, okay? We, we did some, some work on top dressing nitrogen fertilizer at various times relative to putting down Osprey. And if we applied and top dressed our nitrogen the same day that we sprayed Osprey, this is the kind of thing you can run into. You can injure, you can injure wheat. Rarely does it impact yield, but it, it can. And it's one of those things that you've got to give it time. It will eventually outgrow it. Sharp uh, Osprey has a, 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 a protectant in there to minimize this from happening. But when we top dress it with nitrogen, it just, it doesn't, it loses its ability to protect the wheat. The wheat's growing so fast it goes beyond what the, that uh, safener can help with, if you will, okay. That's an ALS inhibitor. You'll see sort of that general yellowing, especially in the new leaves. That's what you're looking for from an ALS inhibitor. Here's another one. Uh, this happens to be in a case where like if lead off were used and we didn't clean out that tank real well, uh, using lead off, 
and an ounce and a half per acre, you'll see wheat that's got this yellowing more down into the new growth, if you will, compared to the check. That is the typical symptoms of what you'll see with, with lead off. Lead off has uh, two ALS inhibitors in there. It's got the thyphen sulfuron and um, Thank you, rim sulfur on. And uh, th again, that's one of those other compounds. If you don't do a good job of wrenching out your spray tank when you're putting down your burn downs, you may very well run into this if you spray your wheat, okay? Uh, okay, we'll, we'll go back to some now, uh, back to the triazines. And this happens to be looking at metribuzin at eight ounces Syncor for those more experienced people that have been around for a long time. Uh, you know what? If you read the label in the fine print, uh, it describes to you about there may be a difference in susceptibility of wheat varieties. And they list some varieties on there, but that, those, those labels are very old and outdated when it comes to, to listing any of the particular varieties and their susceptibility or tolerance to, to metribuzin. We did a work, and I'll show you some of those numbers here a couple of years ago with Bill Bruning on a lot of different varieties that they have in their trial. It's spread on a one-time rep. So it's not what you call high-powered research, but we did identify some varieties that appeared to be fairly susceptible, if you will, to, um, to wheat. Uh, so we pulled out some of the varieties that were susceptible. The Southern States 8415 and this Virginia variety both uh, were appeared to be uh, fairly uh, susceptible to you, if you will, to, uh, to metribuzin. Pioneer 26R10 and the Syngenta 483, although you'll see some injury here, it, it wasn't as nearly as severe as you'll see with the other, uh, the other two varieties. Okay, eight ounces. That's a lot of metribuzin. You know what, we, don't, we, we just don't use that much. Thank gosh, we're talking about a problem here. Okay, having said all that, you know, this is eight ounces applied in the spring. Thank you, sir. What if we were so bold as to reduce that rate and spray it uh, at three ounces per acre? And you know what? It, uh, it, there's, there's a marked difference in terms of what, how much injury you, you see or what you don't see. Even the, the varieties that were pretty susceptible at that eight ounces, you know, they weren't perfect, but I think they, uh, there's no doubt that they had, did not have nearly the amount of uh, response as um, that higher rate, okay? Reduced rates in the fall when weeds are really small, metribuzin may be an option, especially if we're trying to control things like ALS resistant chickweed, okay? Okay, let's talk about my famous chemistry here. It's been around a little bit longer than me. In fact, uh, 2,4-D is the oldest chemistry. And you know what? It's interesting about this chemistry is that it's the oldest and it's probably one of the least understood as to how it works. You know, there's companies have, they're, they're stumbling on and they're getting in some ideas about how 2,4-D works, but it's taken a very, very long time to get there. 2,4-D on wheat. When do we spray that? What, what time, when, where, where, where is the wheat in its life cycle? When it's fully, the safest time to spray 2,4-D is when wheat is fully tillered and just prior to jointing. That's the safest time. Now, I don't want to mislead you. That's, it's not perfect. You can still injure wheat in that window. Uh, so, having said all that, you know, we get these questions. You know what, Martin, what if I wanted to spray in the burn down and put my 2,4-D in there? Friend, it's not labeled, okay? I can't tell you to do it. We did some work on this, and we, we did some various timings with, with 2,4-D. And one particular timing really hammered at home is that when, when we uh, treat wheat in the fall at one to two tillers, this is what you'll get. You know what, and right after we sprayed and we watched this thing going through the winter, 
you couldn't tell the wheat was really uh, hurt by anything. There wasn't any symptoms that showed up at that time. Didn't really show up until the wheat started to emer the wheat heads started to emerge, and you can see these kind of unusual looking heads. It can fool you, you know. Um, last but not least, this is uh, kind of points out some of the data. Now I know you can't read the numbers and all that from your where you're sitting, but we're just Take this, wherever there's yellow, that means it's, it's uh, statistically different than the checks, meaning there's a problem. If you look at the head counts, there's some reduction in the, the head counts, significant reductions in, and also increases in normal, abnormal seed heads. You go across over to yields, and yes, we did impact yields. So whenever we apply 2,4-D in the fall, one to two tillered leaves, that is the worst time we found in this particular studies here okay okay that was a whirlwind tour of uh, my uh, career <laughs> looking at herbicides and how wheat responds